I'm Jack Hatlin. I'm a associate professor emeritus. Uh, I'm in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences. I still maintain an office, even though I've been retired for a few years and spend a couple of days a week there. My colleagues are being treating me very well. I, uh, I graduated in the first class in the sanitary sciences in the Department of Preventive Medicine uh, in 1949. And a couple of years later, my advisor at that invited me to come back to the university and teach a couple of courses and work on my master's degree. And I considered that, so in 1952, fall of 1952, I returned to the university as a lecturer in the Department of Public Health and Preventive Medicine in the School of Medicine and taught in this undergraduate program in the sanitary sciences. And while I thought I'd be there for two, three, four years, I guess I spent a lifetime at the U. Looking at those early years, the medical school was, was really new. Uh, the chairman of our Department of Public Health and Preventive Medicine was a fellow named Lee Powers, an MD. He'd been a health officer at a local or a county health department He'd been state, a director of state health department, and then came to the university as the first chairman establishing this department of public health and preventive medicine. Lee Powers, having community experience, public health experience, had the idea that the medical school should be training people to support public health, such as the sanitary engineers, the sanitarians, the, the non-engineers working in, in what we call environmental health now, as well as health educators and statisticians. And so that in 1947, he brought in a person named Al Green, an engineer that he'd worked with in previous years, to establish this program. And as Al Green got going on campus, I got wind of it from a classmate of mine, and there's this guy over in Hall Health Center who's got a tremendous program. You ought to go over and talk to him. And I did. And I learned a little bit about what Al Green had to say about the sanitary sciences and public health. And so I signed into that program. There were four of us in that first class. And we held classes up in uh, one of the patient rooms on the second floor of Hall Health Center. Uh, and we'd sit and visit and spend time with Al Green uh, with our environmental health courses. And we also had a number of drawing tables in that place where we could sit and do the work that we were supposed to be doing on some of the engineering type stuff that he had us worked on. And it was really handy because right next door there was uh, toilet facilities, there showers. What more could you ask for? Uh, but we spent a lot of time together, the four of us. And so some of my friends graduated in the September of, of 1949 and went to work with Seattle King. I graduated in December, and I started with the Seattle King County Health Department. Uh, and the weather was miserable. Maybe you've heard that mm -hmm. the winter of 1950 was really a bad one uh, if you can relate to where we, whether we've been having this January in uh, January 2007. I just remember I, in going to work my first morning, the, the chain on one of my wheels came loose and got around and locked my brakes in the middle of an intersection in downtown Seattle. And so I was in my suit and overcoat crawling under that car trying to get that chain loose. Uh, it was a a great start on a new job. Uh, a little while later, I I moved, a, a year later, I moved to work with a uh, milk processing plant, a thing that was processing a 
milk in a new and unique way where they canned fresh old milk. You didn't have to refrigerate it. It would stand up for at least six months. And this is really an invaded, in really a creative, inventive sort of thing. And uh, I, uh, I went to work with them, worked on some of their quality control and working with the farms, bringing milk in to the plant, as well as on, on the processing. And I was there then for uh, almost a year when my advisor asked me to come back to, to Seattle. Yeah, I was just married in a short while earlier, and uh, and so my wife and I moved to Seattle. And so there I'm back at the university again. Uh, I guess as I look at it, getting started at the university, I was part-time lecturer and part-time campus sanitarian concerned about some of the activities, particularly food safety was one of the big ones. Uh, vector insect rodent problems on campus was another one we looked at. Uh, but we got involved with things uh, with our food service operations on campus in terms of how they were handling uh, their operations. It was interesting times. Uh, and after a couple of years, we hired a person to come in full-time as campus sanitarian, and I went full-time in preventive medicine. Uh, at, at that time, my advisor had been having some health problems, and he resigned. Uh, well, he went fishing in Alaska for the summer. He had a commercial fishing boat and uh, and did not return because he resigned af after he left. Lee Powers, who had been the chairman, resigned and went to be dean of the School of Public Health in Beirut, Lebanon. So I was there now kind of running this little program. Uh, and a, a fellow from the Public Health Service uh, a training officer uh, joined me and worked with me for a couple of years, and then this person was Walt Dunn, and he went up to the College of Engineering. Uh, he was an engineer, and he was more at home in engineering than he was down in preventive medicine, and so he was there until I think about 1957, and and. Uh, that left me there, and I ran the program for many years, and gradually got some help as things build up. And uh, but that's that was back in the beginning. The the department with the departure of Al Green, and we had an interim chairman of not an interim chairman. We had a, a chairman of of I think it was Bill Reynolds, uh, and a young guy out of Harvard, a brilliant guy, uh, really a neat person. And he was with us for a few years, and he left, I think, in probably 1959, maybe 58. And he went back east again. I, I have no idea where he went. But we had some of the faculty fill in, and we were down to where there were three of us. I was heading the undergraduate program in environmental health, or sanitary science. We had a Catherine Vavre who headed the undergraduate program in health education, and we had a statistician, Blair Bennett, that headed a undergraduate program in biostatistics. And then we used a bunch of part-time faculty to teach medical students uh, in public health and preventive medicine. And we were looking for a, a chairman, and all of a sudden, a fellow named Tom Grayston showed up. He had been in Taiwan for a year or two and was returning to University of Chicago, but he had a, a friend that was the, uh, I think, the assistant dean or associate dean of the School of Medicine. Uh, they had both been classmates at the University of Chicago. And when Tom Grayston heard about the program here and the opening for department chairman, uh, he opted to come to the U of W. 
from 1960 until 1970, Tom Grayston gradually built up this department of, it had been public health and preventive medicine. He changed the name so it was just preventive medicine, which does include public health. Uh, but then Tom built up this program over the next 10 years so that it could become a school of public health. When he first first joined, he, he brought with him some grants. And I worked with him in helping get facilities renovated and his things like that going where he could carry out his research. And after working with him for a couple of years, and that, he asked if I would serve as the administrative officer for the Department of Preventive Medicine, uh, along with my running the undergraduate program. And that turned out to be interesting, and I, I did that with them until we became a school of public health. Um, Tom first built up the teaching of medical students. That was his primary focus as chairman of preventive medicine, and to get his research underway and going. And then he started bringing in faculty. Russ Alexander was the first faculty member he brought in, an epidemiologist. Uh, he brought in Ed Perrin, a uh, statistician, biostatistician from, I think he came in from Pittsburgh School of Public Health. And those were a couple of the, and he brought in George Kenny. George Kenny had just finished his doctorate at University of Minnesota and working on microplasma and he came in and started his microplasma research but also worked with Tom Grayston on his trachoma research. And that was a nucleus uh, that, that the, the department was built on back in the very early 1960s. Uh, it just kind of grew from there. Uh, in biostatistics, Donovan Thompson came in uh, as a senior person. Just a fantastic guy. And this has been a, a colleague of Ed Parents back in Pittsburgh. Uh, and that reinforced and built up the, the biostat end of things in the department. Uh, I can't remember who all came in in terms of epidemiology. There were just a host of people coming in. One, one big one that came in was, was John Fox. This is a person who was back at the what New York Institute or something. He'd been teaching and, and research in Tulane uh, in their School of Public Health. And here this came in as a, as a really a senior person. He was older than any of the fac other faculty that were around. Uh, I think everybody on the faculty at this point was less than 40 years old, and I think John had to be a little over 40 when he came in as the old man of the group. Uh, but he brought in some qualities, too, of, of this senior person that was a, just a, a quiet, stable person. And as things were building along, uh, what, environmental health was kind of a unit. We brought in some environmental health people. We first brought in Harry Martin, uh, an MD from uh, Harvard, interested in emphyse emphysema. And the thing that Harry brought to the department, he headed up this environmental health group. And I guess I need to go back a step. Al Green, when he came in 47, got the teaching program all set up, and then he started doing his own research on air pollution in the city of Seattle. At the same time, the state health department uh, disbanded their industrial hygiene program. And, and Al Green was able to bring the industrial hygiene chemist to the university and a lot of the equipment, industrial hygiene equipment. And, and Al established an environmental research laboratory that would do field studies. And a first major study they were working on was air pollution in, in Seattle King, in, in Seattle, in King County. Uh, and then they started doing contract work 
uh, for various industries or agencies. One was on on gases from some exotic fuels that they're using for space stuff, and uh, they're they're studying what the components of this exhaust was and so forth. And I don't know where all they did things with Boeing Company, and this group established a very good reputation of doing high quality work, and anything that they did was put out as public information. When Harry Martin joined the department. He used to put up a head over this program as well as looking over what I was doing in terms of the undergraduate program. And we were really locked in on space. And we needed space. And one of the things that, uh, that finally Harry Martin found that, that Either we had to have more space and had to have operating funds uh, for this environmental health laboratory, or it had to go. And Tom Grayston found that the Association of Washington Businesses, as well as whatever the statewide union organization was in the state, these two organizations worked together to pass legislation in 1962 that would fund this environmental research laboratory and provided an appropriation for this for the next 10 years. And that then set up this whole thing in operation. In it. And with the money for space, Tom Grayson got matching funds from NIH and so we put a three million dollar addition on the health sciences building, half for the environmental research lab and half for the Department of Preventive Medicine. Uh, we had more space now, and we had space for faculty, and Tom built a program that filled the space. I remember when two or three fellows came out from NIH, and they spent time reviewing what what we were doing in this program and how our building, this addition, was being used. And he, uh, they were also here looking at, at what was going on in, in the, the HI, the, uh, must have been the J-Wing, uh, that had been funded for uh, I think, what, biochemistry and genetics or something like that. They were out looking at these programs to see how we were using our space. And at one of the parting sessions, these people talked about how this is one of the first programs where people had received grant money, and eight years later, they were doing all the things that they said they would do in terms of filling out and using that space. Well, funding of programs is always a battle. And as a part of the School of Medicine, uh, well, I, I should go back a step. I, I don't know much about what I'm talking about. My colleagues can straighten us out and as they talk to you about their reminiscing. But uh, NIH returned returns a small part, uh, a percentage of, of research grants you get to a department or to the university to, for it to use it any way they see fit in carrying out their research programs. And, but there's a limit in terms of how much can be received. And the School of Medicine was maxed out. And if we were to become uh, an independent school of public health, now then, all the grant money that our faculty had, 5% of those NIH funds could revert to the school of public health. And this is money we were not getting. There's another thing that came in. As a school of public health, there were special funds set up to fund schools of public health in terms of faculty, in terms of students, and, and facilities. And John Fox, Tom Grayson had John Fox explore 
becoming a school of public health. There, there were some concerns about becoming a school of public health uh, by the faculty, the, the MDs in our department, that wanted to maintain their, their ties and be a part of the medical school. And so it was felt that we could really be both. We could be a school of public health and we could be Department of Preventive Medicine faculty. Uh, that was all fine and dandy. Uh, uh, Charles Odegaard, who is the president of the university, when this was being considered, uh, decreed or acted on establishing the School of Public Health, but he said it's time to cut the umbilical cord and we would be an independent school. Uh, the people in epidemiology would still teach epidemiology in the school, uh, for medical students, they'd still teach biostatistics and environmental health and so on but they would be School of Public Health faculty. Some of our faculty had joint appointments in after that and so on, but that was kind of traumatic for some of our MDs to get separated away from the medical school. I, I think that with the quality of programs that were being built, and, and I speak as a, a non-MD, uh, a non-PhD, I'm a, not a researcher, uh, but I was there teaching and doing administrative stuff I could see and hear what was going on, and we did have a first-class uh, school of public health, and we had a lot of first-class faculty. A person that I haven't mentioned that came in, we had a couple of other really outstanding people coming in. After we'd been in operation for a few years under Tom Grayson's guidance, the School of Medicine had been seeking to establish some kind of a health administration program. and and the Department of Medicine or a couple of those departments over that way hadn't done anything about it. And so the dean said he wanted to establish this program and Tom Grace said, hey, we'll do it in preventive medicine. And that's when, he, I think that's about the time he brought in, oops, I have to go back a step. Tom Grayson had spotted this young guy that had been down in California State Health Department and was now at Michigan a, a real scholar, a, a tremendous individual named Bob Day. And he brought Bob Day into our department to just come in and do his thing. And at that time, his thing was looking at genetics and public health. Uh, but shortly after this, in fact, I'm not sure, it, it was a year or more before Bob Day could get here. About the time Bob Day was arriving here, is when Tom Grayson had been given the go-ahead to establish this health administration program. And, and Tom Grayson tapped Bob Day to head up this unit, which became the health services program, and later a department. Now Bob Day, in turn, brought in Bill Richardson. And here's another star, Bob Day, uh, became the dean of our School of Public Health and later on became director of uh, Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Bill Richardson uh, became chairman of health services when Bob Day moved up to dean, but then he moved up to be uh, provost for the UW and then went to uh, uh, Penn State uh, as provost or something. And then finally to, not finally, then to Johns Hopkins as president and there's got to be a jump for you. And then the Kellogg Foundation. So there were some fantastic people that have been associated uh, with, with uh, our, our school as it's growing uh, through, this, through the 70s and into the 80s. One of the things that went on when we were a, a Department of Preventive Medicine as administrative officer, we used to have the faculty of you know, 15, 18, 20, uh, 22, 24 as it was growing, would have lunch together uh, on a weekly basis. Maybe it's every two weeks. Uh, it was at least every two weeks. And we'd eat lunch, everybody would bring a sack lunch, and then 
uh, Tom Grace would run down through the, some of the activities, some of the high points that he wanted to talk about or so on. And sometimes faculty would would uh, take just two, three, four, or five minutes to share just a few things about a, a research activity that they had going or something that they're getting started. The faculty knew one another and could relate to each other, and it, it's a group that really worked well together. It, it was just a great feeling, a great camaraderie among the faculty. Uh, well, in 1970, we became a school of public health, and I thought we we're going to have a, a, a faculty meeting, and Tom Grayson says, no, there are no more faculty meetings for the school unless we have an annual meeting or something. Each of these departments now have to start having their own programs and their own faculty meetings and so on. And and that kind of disappointed me. How are we going to keep all these people together? Uh, but each of our departments then have grown like you just can't believe to be the school that we are today. I was associated with the Department of Environmental Health. And when we became a school of public health, we started a graduate pro, a master's of science in public health program uh, in sanitation or environmental health and a master's science program in industrial hygiene, building off of the activities of the Environmental Research Laboratory. And we had a number of industrial hygienists that were with the industrial hygiene lab or the environmental research lab that could could fit in, and and that's where we started our grad program in in environmental health. Uh, and we had several different chairmen in the Department of Environmental Health. Uh, I think the first chairman we had in environmental health was with a person named Jim McCarroll. Uh, this, he, Jim uh, came from Cornell, and he had been conducting a study on air pollution in New York City. And this was just a huge study. And, and you know, in my non-technical background, I, I knew that one of the things coming out of his, his research and the, the massive data that he accumulated was something on a paper about how not to drown in your data. Uh, but Jim McCarroll led our department for a, a, a few years and then built up our program with Bob Frank coming in as a, a, a physiologist uh, that brought us into another area of research in the area of, um, industrial high, of, uh, of environmental health or occupational medicine. Uh, and he brought in some folks like Jane Koenig, who's a professor in, in environmental health today that's been doing some things on uh, indoor air pollution studies and health effects and things of that nature. And there are several people that spun off from that program. Uh, one of our people, uh, uh, Covert, ended up in atmospheric sciences where he could get into greater depths of what he was studying. Uh, Tim Larson went over into the air program in, in civil engineering, or civil and environmental engineering. Uh, so a number of things have, have spawned and got started in our Department of Environmental Health that moved out. We've had an electron microscope uh, activity that uh, Harry Martin started out way back in those early days. and. Uh, We've maintained that over the years, and Dan Luckdell continues to run that program and, and that activity that's really fit into our environmental research laboratory support as well as support of a lot of other activities, research activities in the department. Our master's program built up very slowly. We'd have uh, half a dozen, eight, ten students uh, in the program each year. and. Uh, one of the things that, that developed this, our industrial hygiene master program was underway, is that uh, we received uh, a grant from the National 
National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, I believe it is, for an ERC, Educational Resource Center, to support some faculty and and graduate students in industrial hygiene. And we continue to have that support, which has been a real strong support for, particularly for student support uh, over the years. We had uh, Jim McCarroll, and then we had John Wilson came in as our department chairman. He was from Howard University, had a a PhD, an MD, and was interested in some skin absorption of mercury, was one of his areas of interest. And uh, uh, we got started with an occupational medicine residency program, or a preventive medicine residency program. It was primarily located in epidemiology, but we had some people focusing on environmental health or occupational health uh, in our department. And, and John Wilson worked on that and built that along for a while. When he resigned, somewhere Gil Oman fit in here. Uh, I, I think that had to be a little bit later on. But here was another horrendous individual. Uh, a researcher, a, a very dynamic guy, uh, and and when he came in, one of the things that that the early things that happened was that uh, we built up the toxicology program, and I remember when we we had some eighty applications for the the, uh, the faculty position we had. Uh, uh, there was a committee of us that narrowed that list down to five people, and we presented it to uh, Gil Oman. He went and consulted with some of his high echelon friends, both in 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 medicine and, and about, and opted to hire two people. One was Kurt Omashinsky, who had got his PhD in pharmacology here and had gone back to New Hampshire, I believe. And Elaine Fossman. And uh, each of these people came with grants supporting half their salary. And so when you had one faculty position, Gil Oman hired two toxicologists. And, and, and that added to the toxicologist. Uh, we already had, and I'm, I'm getting out of the sequence here a little bit, because early on in our School of Public Health, uh, I had some funds for a faculty position in environmental health uh, to work in our, our program, and we hired a, a person named Fopé de Waal, a Dutchman, who got his PhD in civil engineering here, and Fopé went back to the University of Wisconsin for a couple of years, then went down to Stanford and was working with uh, McCarthy, McCarty down there, who's an outstanding person in, in that field. And Fopé kind of wanted to get back up this way, and he, when he found out that there was an opening here, uh, and he applied and was accepted. And one of the things he did is that he brought in uh, a grant for a couple of million dollars, a million and a half dollars, maybe it's more than that. It was a lot of money in those days, and today it had been at least two million dollars. But anyhow, whatever it was, he had money to hire a young chemist and a young toxicologist. And so Dave Coleman who had just received his PhD in chemistry, was hired as an analytical chemist. And David Eaton from University of Kansas had just received his PhD in toxicology. Both came out to work and study PAHs in uh, sediments in Puget Sound uh, and developed the, the protocols for 
analyzing these samples and so on, as well as the impacts of some of these chemicals on fish, and that's where the toxicology came in. Uh, and these are two fellows now over the last 28, 29 years have have grown, uh, if you wish. Dave Eaton, it was kind of the start. When John Wilson and then Gil Oman left, Sheldon Murphy w was our toxicologist. Uh, this tremendous guy that came in and built up and, and strengthened our tox program, and particularly the research that we were doing. As he came in, he brought in a couple of folks with him. Uh, he brought in uh, Lucio Costa, who had been doing a lot of work on organic phosphates compounds, pe pesticides, uh, and uh, and so with with Dave Eaton, uh, with Elaine Fossman, and with Kurt Omashinsky, the chair was a, was a guy that was just busier than anybody ever saw. He was on the road a lot. He he was just doing everything everywhere. It seemed like until the last year or two that uh, uh, he was living, just after he arrived, uh, they discovered he had lung cancer. And I remember visiting him, uh, he and his wife Donna, down in the University Hospital where he just had some surgery to remove uh, some of this cancer that was in, in the lung. And, and, uh, he, he recovered and was back and was chairman now, going 60 per for about five years and then six years maybe, and then they found another spot on his lung. And with that, uh, he resigned all of his outside activities and just stayed home. And at that point, I could really appreciate what a tremendous guy he was. Because in those days, I was... I was the graduate program coordinator through the 70s as we were developing, well, through the 80s and for, for a good many years. And uh, and it was not until he stopped all of his outside activities and he was just here in our department that I truly appreciated this guy. Because as graduate program coordinator and heading this one of the, one of the groups within our uh, department, uh, I, uh, I I could really appreciate his insights on things and and his leadership. Uh, we were ha had a couple of chairmen uh, after Sheldon Murphy. Uh, one was Gerald. I think the person that followed him was Gerald Van Bell, and Gerald Van Bell was a statistician. And he came down as an interim chair while we were searching elsewhere for <coughs> while we were searching elsewhere for a, a a new chairman. And after a lengthy search, we brought in three people, and we found one that really fit the bill. And we offered him the position. He accepted the offer. And he came out to to get his feet on the ground and what was here while he's in, going to start his transition to the UW. And I remember he sat with a a group of the the group leaders in environmental health and listened as Gerald Van Bell went through our whole discussion uh, of of activities, whatever was going on, and then. When we're all through, he turned to this person and said, do you have any comments or questions? And uh, he said, well, you know, he said, I think I was lied to. No, no, excuse me. He says, I did not understand what you people were telling me about the space crunch. That the space crunch here is unbelievable. And I don't know what else he might have said, but that was... And he returned home, and uh, he resigned before he could take over as chairman. And that left things in a dilemma. And the EH faculty proposed to the dean that we keep 
Gerald Van Bell as our chairman. And Gerald said that he would consider that as long as he went through the same process that all the others had gone through uh, when they came here for interviews and, and so forth, gave a seminar. Gerald did that, and we still wanted him. And he came with us and was with us for, I assume, must have been 10 years because he must have gone through two terms uh, before he stepped down. And uh, and that's when, when again, Dave Coleman came up as a top individual uh, to be considered for chairman of our department. And so we got one of our own homegrown guys he heading our program who's, again, doing a fantastic job. Now, something I didn't talk about in in the formation of our Department of Environmental Health is that we kind of had the environmental health, sanitation, public health, or technology is what we end up calling it, uh, group. We had the industrial hygiene group, and, and an offshoot of that was the Environmental Research Laboratory. And we had now John Wilson heading up the uh, occupational medicine group, and this consisted of uh, people from, uh, uh, I guess, the Department of Medicine, where they have some occupational activities and some clinics in Harborview, as well as in our own department. And that was kind of a joint one, and it's kind of hard to tell uh, who was medicine or who was environmental health. They're just kind of all one group that seemed to work very happily together. Uh, and that was, that was, uh, I think, our, our four major units. I hope I'm not leaving out somebody. Uh, but, uh, and, and so as, as the heads of, of each of these groups would meet together regularly with the chairman and, and keep our communications going that way. I know the, the group that I headed for many years was the Environmental Health Technology Group, and 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 uh, this was primarily focusing on the undergraduate program, uh, which was still continuing on, and we we got additional faculty uh, from time to time to work in that program, and I can come back and talk about that if we want to get into that at some point, but. Uh, uh, we continue this same process within our, our department today where the heads of these different groups along with people from continuing education and other service groups that are integral parts of the department uh, meet regularly uh, and then carry their message and, and meet with the faculty on a monthly basis. In the uh, Environmental Health Technology Group, uh, we used to meet for lunch every Tuesday noon. And uh, we would talk about student progress. We'd talk about uh, applicants for that might be wanting to enter the program for the next year. We'd talk about student financial support. We'd talk about kind of research activities and things going on. Uh, and uh, uh, at least our group knew each other, what they were doing and so forth, and uh, something that I've enjoyed, and I, I continue to enjoy it because uh, our group still meets every Tuesday for lunch. Uh, they still accept me as a part of the group to come in and eat lunch with them. I must say I'm careful that I don't offer advice unless someone asks for it, and then I don't ramble like I am now. The one thing I've been tied in with in my lifetime at the university is the undergraduate program. And, you know, in those early days in the mid-50s and so forth, uh, uh, we had a, maybe a, as many as 20 students that were between being juniors and seniors in the university. Uh, they finished two years of, of normally the sciences that would be associated with a pre-med program. Uh, and then they they get the environmental health, public health stuff uh, from us uh, in our 
in their junior senior year. And I did that by myself for initially for a year or so, and then Walt Dunn joined us. Then he left, and and uh, eventually I was able to hire one of our uh, one of our graduates that had gone up to Western Washington, got a master's degree in in another health area uh, after she had worked in environmental health for a few years. And we hired uh, Karen Van Dusen. And she came in and picked up a, a significant part of the teaching load and advising of students. And our program continued to grow. And in the mid-60s, we got some funds from uh, uh, the health profession, Bureau of Health Professions in the uh, Health Resources Services Administration. And that did is, gave us a little support money as well as some faculty money. And we hired Bruce Jackson. And this is a person that had been working with the State Health Department for a, a few years. And he came in. And so we had three of us working in in this uh, program. And our, the, the program continued to increase in size. And in our, particularly in our introductory course, we'd have... Uh, 75, got up to 100, uh, and then 125 was a max because of classroom size. And uh, so then uh, well, we had transitions in faculty. Uh, Fop Ada Wall came in and, and participated in teaching some of this. And uh, Karen Van Dusen and I had uh, a grant to do some... Uh, experimental work on how to advance the knowledge and expertise of practitioners in environmental health using different media. And we hired a fellow named Charles Tresser, Chuck Tresser, back in Philadelphia, uh, from Philadelphia. And he joined us, and he got involved with our undergraduate program. Uh, Bruce Jackson moved on to another area. Karen Van Dusen went maternal leave and 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 basically left the program. Uh, uh, so was Fape. Uh, we had Jacques Fagenblum came in for a while from North Carolina and worked with us for a few years in the undergraduate program. And a number of people have pay, played a, a role in, in that undergraduate program. And the U of W has a very good national reputation. Uh, Chuck Tresser and myself have been very involved with our professional organization. Uh, we've received national recognition for what our contributions uh, uh, to the field. Uh, we have students that are scattered all over the state, but we've got them scattered all over public health service in different areas. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's neat going to meetings when you are continually seeing some of your graduates uh, uh, and it's amazing to see that, that a bunch of these people are already retiring uh, uh, when you think that they were just students a few years ago. But the undergraduate program has always been a cyclical sort of thing where we'll go up and we'll have maybe 40 students and then it'll drop down to 20 and three years later, it'll start climbing again, and this time it'll get up to 50 or even 60, and it'll drop down to 40, and then it'll get up. And and we went through a big crunch in, in enrollment in the early to mid-1990s. And we are just coming out of that slump in a significant way, but we dropped to the point where we only had five majors one fall quarter uh, starting in the program. Uh, we hadn't been that low in in 50 years. And uh, this wasn't a phenomenon that's happening just here at the UW. This was happening not only across the country, uh, because I've been actively involved with the accreditation body that reviews these programs and so forth, and 
and we have an association of these programs that I'm involved with and Chuck Trice is involved with. And we know what's going on in these programs. And furthermore, on the international basis, the same thing was happening in England, is happening in Australia, it happened in Sweden, uh, and I'm not sure where else. Uh, but the good news is that we've weathered that storm. Uh, Dave Coleman has been a strong supporter of the undergraduate program as well as the dean. Uh, and we have had a very good undergraduate program. So what year did you start? 1952. And it worked until, when did you retire? Well, I retired in 82 and dropped to 42% uh, to 40% time. Right. And, but uh, what I basically, I was, for, for 10 years, I was the uh, director of allied health for the Health Sciences Center as a part-time activity and graduate program coordinator, head of the technology group, and running undergraduate program. So I was I was kind of kind of stressed, and in '82 I went on 40 percent, and I thought it'd give me a lot of relief in the department as well, and and uh, but I gave up the allied health thing, and in the department, well, I was, that turned out okay, and so I did that until. 1995, and then I dropped the graduate program coordinator and the technology group and the undergraduate program, and I, I just taught the last two years. And, and I just had a ball those last two years. I, I really enjoyed teaching in the early years before I got all these other things going and, and so forth, and there's this constant battle of you really have to keep up because environmental health is a very dynamic field. and uh, to keep up with what's happening in terms of drinking water, uh, wastewater, uh, vector-borne diseases, and so on. And it, 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 I, I look back to what we're doing in teaching food sanitation. And 50 years ago, we talk about that, you know, we've got one big thing in terms of food intoxication, which is caused by Staphylococcus aureus, and we've got foodborne infections caused by Salmonella, primarily Enteritidis, and and a few other uh, species that that are fairly common. And we recognize that there's a couple other things, and we knew that there was hepatitis, infectious hepatitis is a viral thing. That's kind of the, the ballpark. And over the years, uh, and, and we could also talk in terms of food safety, what foods these would be in and so forth, and it was, it was really kind of limiting what you had to do. And, and as these years have gone along, Man alive, we can find out that that uh, we got just, uh, I was going to say dozens, I was going to say hundreds, but it might be more accurate to say dozens more of pathogens that we recognize that are, are causing problems. The, 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 the rotavirus or the, the Norwalk virus that, uh, on, on board ships that can, can involve food uh, as well as fomites. Uh, and the uh, E. coli, you know, E. coli is something that all of us have, but we got over into a specific strain, 0157H7. And that's the thing that, that in the Jack in the Box incident, uh, end up, you know, I think we had kids that died in that. We, we had kids that really had their lives changed for them and will never be quite like they could be. And, and that kind of spearheaded stuff and interest in food safety. And we've gone gangbusters since that time with, with food safety. And still, what, what we're lacking in this country is a unified program on food safety. It's spread between Food and Drug Administration, Department of Agriculture, and who knows who else, uh, the Department of Commerce, uh, and, and so on, uh, as it gets into some of our seafood. and Yeah, it's, that's big stuff.